Welcome back to Metabolic Mind, where we explore the connection between metabolic and mental health and metabolic therapies like nutritional ketosis as psychiatric therapies. I'm Dr. Brett Scher. Today we'll discuss the lab workup most experts recommend before starting nutritional ketosis for mental illness, and we'll provide resources in the description to help you get started. We'll also cover how often someone should consider checking those labs and what you might expect to see as ongoing changes. Plus, we'll have a separate video reviewing other lifestyle metrics that, that don't require a lab or a doctor involvement, so stay tuned for that one. Metabolic Mind is a nonprofit initiative launched by Bazooki Group, a philanthropic venture started by Roblox founder and CEO David Bazooki and his wife, author Jan Bazooki. David and Jan had the idea for Metabolic Mind after their son Matt recovered completely from a serious mental illness, in this case bipolar disorder 1, using a therapeutic ketogenic diet. David and Jan fund research on metabolic therapies for mental illness through the Bazooki Brain Research Fund and launched Metabolic Mind as an educational resource for patients, families, and clinicians interested in learning more. They also want to offer a message of hope. Freedom from the burden of mental illness is possible. Our channel is for informational purposes only. We're not providing individual or group medical or healthcare advice or establishing a provider-patient relationship. Many of the interventions we discuss can have dramatic or potentially dangerous effects if done without proper supervision. Consult your healthcare provider before changing your lifestyle or medications. Before we jump into specific labs and tests, it helps to understand why we even suggest them in the first place. The first reason is to get a baseline so you can track changes over time. But the second is to screen for pre-existing conditions. If you find an abnormal lab result after starting a new diet, you need to know if it was there beforehand or if it resulted from the nutritional changes, right? Kind of makes sense. And also there's some very rare contraindications to nutritional ketosis that you'd want to know beforehand. So that's the background, but now let's get into the labs. We'll start with a list of standard labs that just about every doctor should be able to order and that you could consider checking before starting nutritional ketosis as therapy for mental illness. These include complete blood count or CBC, Comprehensive Metabolic Panel, or CMP, Thyroid Stimulating Hormone, or TSH, Lipids, Hemoglobin A1C, Uric Acid, Insulin, Vitamin D, and drug levels for various psychiatric medications. There are also other potentially helpful labs you could consider that are not as routine, so it may be more challenging to get doctors to order them, but they're worth knowing about and discussing with your doctor. You can find an article on how to talk to your doctor about ketogenic diets and psychiatric disorders in the video description below, which may help you. But the additional labs include an advanced lipid profile, including lipoprotein NMR, ApoB, ApoA1, also measurements of insulin resistance like LPIR or an insulin resistance score, and potentially more detailed thyroid evaluation like a free T4 or free, three, free T3. Now, in some settings, you may also want to consider carnitine, selenium, or zinc levels. Don't worry, that's a lot, and I'll cover each one in more detail later so you can make sense of this alphabet soup and, and kind of better understand the purpose, you know, the expected changes, and the evaluation frequency. So, let's start with the medication levels. Nutritional ketosis can lower the blood levels of medications such as lithium, Depakote, Tegretol, and others. But what's interesting is that a decreased level may not always mean the medication is less effective. That's why clinicians like Dr. Georgia Ead clearly state that prescribing physicians should resist the reflex to increase the dose if the level goes down. Instead, she recommends that clinicians correlate the drug level with any occurrence of symptoms. For example, if someone's feeling much better with improved psychiatric symptoms, but the lithium level decreases, that's not necessarily an indication to automatically increase the dose. In fact, as Dr. Eid and others suggest, it may demonstrate that it's possible to lower the dose safely in an organized and careful fashion. You can learn more about adjusting psychiatric medications in our dedicated video, including extensive interviews with Dr. Eid and Matt Bazuki. Okay, next let's go into detail on some of the standard tests. So let's see, a CBC helps screen for anemia and evaluates your white blood cells and platelets. Even though we would not expect much of a change with ketosis, it's important to have this as a baseline measurement. A comprehensive metabolic panel evaluates liver and kidney function, also sodium and potassium levels, and acid-base status and glucose, so there's a lot in that one test. This type of metabolic panel should be done after fasting for at least eight hours as it makes the glucose measure more standardized. Now, if someone has severe kidney or liver disease, they would need to work with an experienced clinician before starting nutritional ketosis. Some individuals may see improvement in liver tests if they have something like fatty liver 
or they may find their blood sugar improves after going on nutritional ketosis. But interestingly, fasting glucose can go up or down depending on the individual, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a bit. But next, let's get into TSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone. An underactive thyroid, represented by an elevated TSH, is associated with depression and weight gain and increased LDL cholesterol. And psychiatric medications like lithium can slow thyroid function, so it's really important to establish a baseline before starting keto. It's controversial how detailed the lab screening needs to be, but a TSH is a, certainly a minimum to start with, but it's usually also helpful to add free T4 or free, th free T3 as they can provide more detailed information about thyroid status and since the medications can alter them. Now, the free T4 level may decrease with nutritional ketosis, but it's not clear that that's clinically relevant. For instance, if the free T4 decreases, but the TSH stays the same and there are no symptoms of hypothyroidism like fatigue or weight gain or constipation, and then it may not be a clinically relevant change. So remember, the key is to look for a correlation or lack thereof between lab changes and clinical symptoms. But it's also important to remember that many psychiatric medications can alter thyroid function and TSH alone may not detect this at an early stage. So that's why we suggest checking TSH plus uh, free T4 and free T3 in most cases. All right, next let's talk about vitamin D. Low vitamin D levels can be associated with psychiatric symptoms, especially depression. In addition, antipsychotic medications can lower vitamin D levels, so it's important to screen at baseline. If levels are low, someone can raise them by getting safe sun exposure or sometimes even by taking supplements. And another important vitamin to check is vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 deficiency can sometimes present with symptoms of depression, psychosis, or even dementia or delirium. Therefore, for any psychiatric disorder, it's really helpful to have a B12 at baseline. And when starting nutritional ketosis, it's no different. You'll want to check it at baseline and see how it changes over time. Lipids are the next test on the list. The standard lipid profile includes LDL, HDL, and triglycerides. So when starting nutritional ketosis, most people will see their HDL increase and triglycerides decrease. Interesting though, on average, the literature suggests that LDL does not change for most people, and if it does, it's more likely to go up a small amount, like around 10% or less. But it can go up much higher in some people, and this is where it's helpful to have more advanced lipid testing like ApoB and ApoA1, as the ApoB to A1 ratio is a useful predictor for cardiovascular risk, even more predictive than LDL alone. And it can also be helpful to know the size and number of LDL particles. So as a perfect example, Verta Health, they did a, a study and presented their one-year data demonstrating that on average, LDL went up by 10% with nutritional ketosis. However, there was no change in ApoB, small LDL particles decreased, and overall cardiovascular risk decreased by 12%. But they would never have known that if they'd only checked the LDL. That's why I feel getting a more detailed lipid evaluation is really advantageous and almost required, even though not all medical professionals agree. Individuals can order their own labs at websites like ownyourlabs.com and others if needed. So that's like a new feature that's kind of becoming more popular. That's pretty cool. Another thing to be aware of with LDL is that some studies report there can be a transient elevation that returns to normal at about 6 or 12 months. So near the end of this video, we'll talk a little bit more about elevated LDL, specifically focusing on low-carb hyper-responders. But next, let's talk about uric acid. You know, uric acid is a normal waste product that occurs basically as our body sort of breaks down cells. So uric acid can go up for some people on a ketogenic diet, but again, it may not necessarily signify a problem. It's most important if someone has pre-existing gout or kidney stones. All right, next, let's talk about testing metabolic function and insulin resistance. One of the main benefits of nutritional ketosis is improving metabolic health. So getting a baseline for this is really helpful. A hemoglobin A1c is a three-month average for blood glucose or blood sugar, which can be helpful to check and follow every three months. An insulin level checked when you're fasting is also beneficial as you can combine it with glucose to calculate what's called a HOMA IR, which is a sensitive marker for insulin resistance. Now remember, insulin is responsible for allowing your cells to take in glucose and use it to produce energy. But if someone is insulin resistant, insulin levels rise and efficient energy production goes down. So it's really important to test for. The other important part about getting an insulin level and an A1C is that it can help you interpret changes in glucose. So most people with metabolic dysfunction and insulin resistance will see their fasting glucose decrease over time with nutritional ketosis. However, some people, especially those who are more insulin sensitive, 
may actually see their fasting glucose increase on a keto diet. There are terms for this, such as adaptive glucose sparing or physiologic insulin resistance, or if it happens in the morning, it can be referred to as the dawn phenomenon. The idea is that our liver produces more glucose through a process called gluconeogenesis, which is a very different phys physiologic process than chronically elevated levels of glucose and elevated insulin from metabolic dysfunction. So, so let me say that again. With insulin resistance or like prediabetes, you tend to have elevated glucose and elevated insulin. But with adaptive glucose sparing, you may have temporarily elevated glucose, especially in the morning, but with low insulin levels. That's why many believe an isolated elevated fasting glucose in the context of good metabolic health may not necessarily be a problem. And that's why checking a fasting insulin and hemoglobin A1C can be really helpful. There's an article from dietdoctor.com that we'll list to below that goes into a little more detail about this. The quick summary is, if fasting glucose goes up while A1C and insulin goes down, it's likely a normal physiologic response and not a health risk. And evaluating levels further with something like a continuous glucose monitor, a CGM, may be even more helpful to observe patterns and get a daily rolling average of your blood sugar. So please discuss these considerations with your physician and you can check out the educational guide in the, descri in the description for more information. Another test to consider is a carnitine level. Carnitine is a compound that transports fatty acids to be used as an energy source. Leading keto dietitians Beth Zubek-Kanya and Denise Potter and metabolic psychiatry pioneer Dr. Chris Palmer all recommend checking total and free carnitine levels in everyone starting therapeutic ketosis since low carnitine levels may prevent someone from achieving adequate ketone levels. And a clinician may recommend L-carnitine supplements under careful clinical guidance. The next question we wanna cover is how often should you get these types of labs? Well, experts generally agree that you should test them at baseline before starting therapeutic ketosis. And many agree that a follow-up test is reasonable within a six to 12 week period after starting a keto diet. After that, testing is based on the results. Abnormal findings should be followed up sooner, right? Such as another six weeks, whereas normal findings can be followed up in 12 weeks or even more. Drug levels may require more frequent checking, especially if there's any increase in psychiatric symptoms. I know that's a little vague and it's because there is no sort of formal agreed upon guideline. And that's why working with your clinician is really important to determine how often to check. Well, so now those are the most common and most important labs to check, but others may be based on your medical history. So this list is not comprehensive and not meant to be medical advice, but you can bring this list to your physician and see if there are others that they would want to add based on your history and you know a thorough evaluation. Now there are other metrics to check that have nothing to do with lab tests. So make sure you watch our next video, which covers the most important of those in more detail. But before we conclude this video, let's revisit the topic of elevated low density lipoprotein or LDL cholesterol. As I previously mentioned, most studies demonstrate that on average, LDL does not increase significantly with nutritional ketosis. And I showed an example of how a small increase in LDL can be offset by no changes or even benefits in ApoB and the size of the LDL particles and improved overall metabolic health. But now there is a subset of population which have been termed LDL hyper responders who see a dramatic rise in their LDL concentration to levels previously only seen with the genetic mutation familial hypercholesterolemia. This area is being actively studied by citizen scientist Dave Feldman and cardiovascular researcher and cardiologist Dr. Math Budoff. The lean mass hyper responders is a fairly polarizing topic with some people saying it it's incredibly high risk and needs to be treated the same as any other LDL elevation, including the genetic abnormalities. Whereas others say it's of no consequence and can be ignored. Well, I certainly don't recommend ignoring it by any stretch, but, but rather it's important to work with an experienced clinician to put this into context of your overall health and cardiovascular risk and to weigh an increased LDL against any benefit you may be seeing from nutritional ketosis. As more evidence becomes available, we'll certainly learn more about elevated LDL within the context of nutritional ketosis. But for the time being, many experts believe it needs to be seriously considered and put into the context of your overall health and cardiovascular risk. Since this is such a big topic, we'll do a future video pretty much specifically dedicated to LDL, to cardiovascular risk and nutritional ketosis. So, so keep an eye out for that. But here's a key point I wanna make. LDL is one of many cardiovascular risk factors. So as a doctor and a cardiologist, I care much more about your overall cardiovascular risk than I do about one solitary lab test. 
I also care deeply about the benefits that someone may be getting from an intervention. So if an intervent, so if an individual uses nutritional ketosis to put a life-threatening psychiatric illness into remission, that goes a long way into offsetting a change in a single blood test. And also, I guess the last thing is many options exist to lower LDL while remaining in ketosis. So if that's a path someone wants to take, there are plenty of options. All right, so if you want to hear more about the evidence and practical approach to understanding cardiac risk with nutritional ketosis, please watch our video on that subject. But that's it for this video. So thank you so much for watching. I'm Dr. Brett Schur. We hope this was helpful to give you some idea of the labs that you may want to check, how to discuss them with your physician, um, and check the description below for you know a printout that you can have to bring in. And remember that you can always kind of use another site like ownyourlabs.com or some other site to check your labs, but confer with your doctor on the results and how often to check them. And please don't do this on your own. All right. Again, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you here next time at Metabolic Mind.